Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Susan Lucille Wright? She is also known as the blue-eyed butcher. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So first, I'll cover the background in this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime then offer my analysis. Starting with the background, Susan Wright was born in Houston, Texas on April 24, 1976. She was an average student. When she was in high school, she looked for attention from boys. She was sensitive to criticism. After graduating from high school, she worked at a hair salon and briefly at a topless bar where she was a dancer. In 1997, she took a trip to Galveston, Texas with a friend. There she met a 29-year-old convicted felon named Jeffrey Andrew Wright. He had pleaded guilty to felony drug possession in 1996. Jeff was particularly interested in Susan and quite assertive. He called her several times a day. He would bring her flowers and little gifts. He took her to nice restaurants and nightclubs. She became pregnant and the couple married about eight months later. The couple had a son and in 2002 they would have a daughter. Susan and Jeff lived in a house in White Oak Bend, which is in northwest Houston. Jeff worked as a sales representative for carpet and tile companies. He frequently used illegal drugs, liked to visit topless clubs, and had multiple affairs. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On January 13, 2003, 26-year-old Susan Wright tied 34-year-old Jeff Wright to their bed and stabbed him 100 and 93 times with two different knives. One knife was referred to as a small hunting knife. She used a hand truck to transport his body to the backyard where she buried him in a hole that he had been digging to install a fountain. She also repainted the bedroom and cut out pieces of carpet. The next day she filed a domestic abuse report in an effort to get a restraining order. On January 18, Susan asked her attorney to come by her house. When he arrived, she told him that she had stabbed Jeff to death and buried him in the backyard. Her attorney made his way to the Harris County District Attorney's Office and informed them that there was a dead body at the location. He did not tell them anything else. By the time the investigators arrived at the Wright family home, the family dog had unearthed part of Jeff's corpse and chewed off his left hand. On January 24, Susan turned herself in at the Harris County Courthouse. The next day, she was charged with murder. During the trial, the prosecutors actually brought the bloody mattress into the courtroom and demonstrated how Susan may have committed the murder. The defense argued that Susan was acting in self-defense. She had been harmed by Jeff for many years. They explained her behavior after the killing by saying she was delusional. On March 3, 2004, Susan Wright was convicted of first-degree murder. The next day, she was sentenced to 25 years in prison. After an appeal of the punishment phase, her sentence was reduced to 20 years. Around the time of that resentencing, she was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. Susan Wright was released from prison in December of 2020. She will be on probation until 2024. Now moving to my analysis. So the big question, of course, is was Susan Wright actually guilty of murder? I will look at the evidence both for and against the idea that she was guilty. I will start with the inculpatory evidence. Susan admitted to stabbing Jeff to death and burying him in her backyard. It makes her look like she could have been a killer, mostly because of the stabbing part. Susan tried to destroy evidence at the crime scene by painting the bedroom and cutting out the carpet. Some of the areas in the room had been bleached. There were empty containers of bleach in the trash can. There was a full container of bleach in Susan's car. She put the mattress, box spring, comforter, and the headboard in the backyard. Susan tied Jeff to the bed using neckties and a bathrobe sash. The neckties were found around his wrists, and the bathrobe sash was around one of his ankles. There was also red candle wax found in his genital area. This makes it seem as though Susan was trying to use the prospect of sex to get Jeff in a vulnerable position. Jeff was stabbed seven times in his pubic area, which is not usually a common target in a self-defense situation, and all of those cuts were superficial. 
Susan had filed to get a restraining order. She told the police that after twisting her arms, shaking her violently, and shoving her against the wall, Jeff left the house saying he was tired of her and the kids. Of course, in reality, she had murdered Jeff and buried him in the backyard. Unless she thought that Jeff was somehow going to turn into a zombie and attack her, she made false statements when trying to get the restraining order. The day before she called her attorney to tell him about the body, she told the police that she still didn't know where Jeff was, and she remained concerned about him coming back to the house. Jeff had a $200,000 life insurance policy, so perhaps money was a motive. A friend of Jeff's testified overhearing a phone conversation between Susan and Jeff, in which Susan berated Jeff for filling out life insurance paperwork incorrectly. Susan had been a topless dancer for two months when she was 18. The prosecutors essentially argued that this meant her emotions were insincere. I don't think this is a good or accurate argument, but it may have carried weight with the jury. The prosecution implied that Jeff was certainly no angel, but Susan was exaggerating her injuries. They noted that Susan never received medical treatment for any injuries. Now moving to the exculpatory factors, the factors that point toward innocence. Susan admitted to the killing, but said it was self-defense. She claimed that Jeff had been abusive for many years. She had to be perfect. If she made mistakes, he would turn violent. He had a quick temper. In addition to the felony drug possession conviction, Jeff was convicted for assault after he attacked one of the dancers with whom he was having an affair. One of Jeff's friends characterized Jeff as someone who flew into drug-fueled violent rages. When you hear the term drug-fueled, you automatically know it will not be followed by something positive. No one ever says drug-fueled job promotion or drug-fueled learning opportunities. A number of people, including Susan's mother, sister, friends, and a hairdresser, noted that Susan would have unusual injuries on her body on occasion, like bruises. They were unexplained, and many people assumed that they were the result of domestic violence. Later, on appeal, Jeff Wright's ex-fiance testified that she had been harmed by Jeff during the course of a four-year relationship. This evidence is what led to the five-year reduction in Susan's prison sentence. In the Wright family home, there were holes in the wall that had been patched. Allegedly, Jeff Wright had created those with his fists. A bathroom door frame was broken. Allegedly, Jeff had slammed the door on Susan's arm. Jeff had an extensive history of drug use. The autopsy revealed cocaine in his system. The night of the killing, Susan indicated that Jeff came home after boxing lessons high on cocaine and struck their son. It sounds like he was trying to box with their son, and of course, their son didn't like that. He was being hit by his father. Susan went to talk to Jeff about his anger problems and his drug use. She threatened to leave him if he did not get help. According to Susan, he pushed her to the floor, kicked her in the stomach repeatedly, then took her into the bedroom and sexually assaulted her. After this, he threatened to kill her with a knife. Susan claimed that she managed to get the upper hand in this situation where he was threatening her with a knife by slamming her knee into his groin. She grabbed the knife and started stabbing him. Susan weighed 120 pounds. Jeff weighed 220 pounds. As far as the excessive stabbing, Susan addressed this when she testified on her own behalf during the trial. She said, I couldn't stop stabbing him. I couldn't stop. I knew as soon as I stopped, he was going to get the knife back and he was going to kill me. I didn't want to die. Her defense actually used the 193 stab wounds to argue that Susan must have been a victim. Who else would lash out with such anger and rage? To explain the seven superficial pubic area stab wounds, Susan indicated this was for all the times that Jeff made her have sex when she did not want to. To explain the whole restraining order situation that I talked about under inculpatory evidence, Susan's attorney said that after she killed her husband, she spent several days in a fog during which she believed that her husband was alive and would climb out of the impromptu grave in the backyard to kill her. So it sounds as though she was going with the old pet cemetery defense, or as it's otherwise known, the walking dead defense. Susan referenced what may have been a dissociative state or an out-of-body experience when she was talking to her mother. She said, Mama, it wasn't me. I snapped. I was up there and I saw somebody do it, but it wasn't me. 
The zombie theory also explains why she cleaned the crime scene. Susan implied that Jeff would be particularly angry over a mess in the bedroom. Zombies are known for their undying commitment to cleanliness. The defense also noted that Susan did a terrible job with the cleanup. It was comically bad. There was blood spatter everywhere, not indicative of someone who was calculating. Weighing all the evidence in this case, I think that Susan was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. There are several large problems with the theory of her defense. Tying up Jeff is inconsistent with self-defense and inconsistent with a heat-of-the-moment murder. In addition, she tried to destroy evidence, and her whole story about being afraid of zombie Jeff just doesn't seem reasonable. I think that her story about being harmed by Jeff is more of something that would be considered during the punishment phase as opposed to the trial. Ultimately, I think that was reflected in her sentence, not only the initial sentence of only 25 years, but the reduction on appeal. There's no such thing as premeditated self-defense. During an interview, Susan suggested that she kept asking herself why she just didn't leave or call the police long before the murder. She felt as though she was trapped. She was scared. That's why she didn't call for help earlier. I think this could be legitimate. This can certainly happen to victims of domestic violence, but it cannot be used to justify homicide unless there is an immediate danger. Now, some people have argued that Jeff received what he deserved. Susan's attorney would say during the interview, quote, I hate to say it, but some people just deserve killing, unquote. I think this is an unhealthy way to think about justice. I do believe that Jeff was a terrible partner, and I think Susan was a victim. I think the problem is that she could not prove much of the harm that had occurred, and when she made a lot of claims about being a victim after the murder, her testimony seemed insincere, like she was just coming up with those stories to escape taking responsibility. The prosecution impugned Susan's character because she was a topless dancer for two months, suggesting that this meant her emotions were insincere. I think this was unfair. Dancers do not have any particular tendency toward insincerity, no more so than anyone else. The prosecution took their attack too far with this and probably with the entire mattress episode in the courtroom. I think taking an attack too far is really the theme of this case, not only for the prosecution, but for Susan and Jeff as well. As far as Susan, her behavior was extreme. The homicide, the cleanup, claiming to be delusional. It was just too difficult to believe. As far as Jeff, he was repeatedly harmful over the course of many years, which greatly contributed to Susan developing anger. She was tired of being a victim, tired of being hurt, and eventually made Jeff pay for his unwise actions. Those are my thoughts on the case of Susan Wright. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis on this topic to be undyingly insightful. Thanks for watching. I've had a few questions about the cactus in the background, this specific cactus. It's actually not a real cactus. It's made of wood. And, well, so I guess it was at some point like a tree. But it's a, it's a wooden cactus, and it has like some type of paper on it on this one side. Looks like the colors of the United States flag. And then the green here. My wife bought this and made it for me. Like, so she bought the, the wood cactus and then put the, I guess, it's some type of paper on it. So it has the two sides. It's very useful. Kind of can be adapted to various situations or moods. Uh, the name I came up with for this cactus, I'm a big fan of action heroes like sci-fi and adventure movies like... Um, DC Comics and Marvel and all that. So I decided to name this cactus Harvey Two-Face, right, because of the two sides. Seemed appropriate and fitting for the capabilities of this particular cactus. It's nice when a name can reflect the strengths, although I know Harvey Two-Face was a villain, but this cactus certainly is not a villain. This cactus is a hero version who will uh, assist in decorating the background for years to come, I hope. So anyway, I just wanted to explain this new cactus in the background. As always, thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.